B-Pod Studios. This is Talkin' Rock. Talkin' Rock. Your backstage pass to some of your favorite rock artists. Here's your host, Meltdown. I gotta be honest, I don't have many in-studio guests anymore, uh, but this one is in-studio. A lot of times it's over Zoom, uh, which is really cool. Sometimes on the phone, which isn't as good, but it's still cool. But it was great to have James J.Y. Young from Styx in-studio on this episode of Talk and Rock, we talk about a lot of things, including their upcoming tour with Foreigner and John Wayne, who I absolutely love. Uh, we talk about the effect that grunge music had on them. At first, he said zero, and then his manager kind of nudged him a little bit, and we started talking more about that. What about the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? They seem to be shunning sticks. We'll talk about that. Are, are sticks a rock band or a progressive rock band? Where does he think they lie? In the genre. We'll talk about that as well. Lots to get to today with James J.Y. Young of Styx on Talking Rock. J.Y., thanks for coming in. I see you uh, You survived the eclipse. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, a few seconds of pure darkness uh, is good for all of us. Did you see? Where, where, where were you at? In Chicago? Uh, I think so. Yeah. So you probably didn't see much or no? Uh, I I didn't bother. No. <laughs> no, I've, I've, I've seen pretty much total eclipses in the past from different spots when I had the time and energy to go chase it. Yeah. Uh, but you have to chase it. Right. Yeah, chase it. Well, we're going <laughs> to be chasing you this this uh, summer. You got uh, that big tour with uh, the Renegades and Jukebox Heroes Tour with, I mean, uh, Foreigner. John Waite, who I love. Fantastic. Love John Waite. Yeah. He's one of the nicest guys, too. Um, good man, he is. And uh, we've worked with those guys before when he was at, you know, was part of the babies. And... Uh, so, yeah, we're, it's going to be just a, one big happy summer. Yeah, and that's coming here on uh, June 15th. So you still like touring? Uh, touring's my favorite thing. Is it really? Put those people out there and let me do my thing. Yeah. You know, hiding in a studio, trying to go in over and over the same part. Oh, that doesn't, I'm not sure that works. I don't care. <laughs> we're, we're leaving that one there. <clears throat> yeah, I saw an interview the other works day. Works for me. Yeah, Uli, Uli John Roth. You know him? Right, remember, he was the original guitar player of the Scorpions. Anyways, no. he said that one of the things he hated was working in the studio. So I guess that's like you as well. Well, I love the Scorpions. <laughs> Deutschland. <laughs> Did your paths ever Klaus cross? Meiner. Klaus uh, Meiner is a lead singer. <laughs> your paths ever cross those oh, guys? Oh, yeah, we, we opened for the Scorpions a bunch of times back before we broke out big. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I, I love that band. I was thinking about this earlier. So back in the 70s, you must have crossed paths with a lot of Detroiters. Uh, uh, Nugent, Seeger, Alice Cooper, all of them, eh? Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, <clears throat> the woman that, that works for me is a huge Ted fan. And uh, uh, Ted was always kind of kept to himself. But then when Tommy moved to uh, to Michigan, and of course, then Damn Yankees. Mm. Well, and, of course, Tommy and Ted were yeah. like this. And then ultimately... Uh, so, and Ted, typically, sometimes we would open for Ted. Um, sometimes Ted would open for us. And uh, Ted, Ted's a delightful, delightfully crazy man. <laughs> that he is. Is, uh, is, is Jack, is, uh, I'm sorry, does, uh, does Tommy still have a place here? It's on the western side, no? I don't think okay. so. Okay. Don't think so. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if Tommy uh, ever told you about the story, but I was there in Buffalo that night with the Faith No More guys. Did you ever hear that story? I did not. All right. We'll, sa- we'll save that for another time. Okay. That's not really radio appropriate, but uh, him, and, <laughs> him and Jack Blades were doing an acoustic set uh, for the local station there, 97 Rock. Okay. And I was talking to Billy Sheehan, and I'll just leave you with this. Uh, at one point, Billy w- and I were interrupted by Billy's assistant saying he's got his pants down talking about the singer of Faith No More. So, well, <laughs> any photos? <laughs> <laughs> that was that was long before the uh, the, the photo thing. So, hey, you know, uh, I was I was uh, I was given that uh, that video uh, interview with you and Dan Rather uh, and and Tommy and, and Gowan as well, Lawrence Gowan. And uh, in, in in there, you, you mentioned about the tough guy hockey players that, who like babes. So I'm a hockey guy. So I want to hear who the tough guy <laughs> hockey players are. Uh, Do you remember? I'm trying to remember who told me that that was. Uh... <laughs> Uh, this guy Grant Mulvey, he's about six foot, six six. He's a couple, couple he's, I'm six two, and he's four inches taller than me. Uh, and nicest guy in the world. He, he called me up and says, "Hey, Jay, well, let's go out to lunch." Um, he's retired. Um, but but back in back in Chicago, there was a bunch of tough guys that you probably watched play hockey. Oh oh yeah, well it, it's the uh, John Panazzo, uh, our r- drummer. 
Yeah. He he played semi pro goaltender. And his, his, uh, I know his, his family was not so happy about it. Uh, he says, you're just like a you're, you're target practice on you kind of a thing. <laughs> and uh, But we, we'd, get, we'd go out and uh, after a Blackhawks game, we'd meet, we'd meet the players in the bar and da-da-da-da and uh, do stupid things that uh, young men do. <laughs> I'm hearing that maybe it was Ty, Ty Domi might have liked Babe. Is that... Does that ring a bell? It could be. could be. Uh, I never met Ty to my knowledge. I might, might have, I might have been introduced to him and shake his hand. Yeah. But I thought that perhaps when you brought that up, I was thinking Bob Prober because he was a big, uh, you know, uh, big bruiser here. Mm. So, but maybe that. Yeah. But it's funny you mentioned, uh, you, you mentioned uh, Todd, your drummer. I was riding my motorcycle the other day and I went by uh, one of the local uh, studios here, recording studios, and there was like 15 cars. And so I texted my friend. I'm like, what's going on at your studio? And he was doing a master class there. Todd was. Yeah. Yeah, Todd goes around the country doing master classes, and he's been, in Modern Drummer Magazine, he's been voted the top rock drummer for the last 10 years. Mm. Yeah. So. Uh, he's a beast, yeah. Fortunate to have him. I grew up in the Chicago area. His dad is a um, is a doctor <laughs> <laughs> who does play drums. Yeah. But it's, it's kind of a crazy thing for the doctor's son to be the top rock drummer on the planet, so yeah. I mean, you guys are also uh, such talented musicians. And in, in that Dan Rather interview, you're talking about that, and uh, you got to feel fortunate after all these years to be playing with some guys at that level. Uh, Todd, being the best drummer, and me being like thirty, I'm old enough to be his father, maybe his grandfather. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think I am old enough to be his grandfather. Uh, it's just great to have him there next to me. It's it's like, uh, and then Tommy Shaw is. Tommy Shaw is Tommy Shaw. That's all you can say. Uh, Lawrence Gowan um, is uh, replaced Dennis DeYoung a long time ago, and, and Lawrence was a superstar in Canada, and we just happened to make good friends with him. And uh, and now, uh, in addition to Lawrence Gowan, we have his brother on bass guitar, mm. Terry, right? So we we got the two gowns on the stage, and we got Todd, and that's that's a monster monster rhythm section, and uh, yeah, I remember Gowan from when I was a kid, growing up uh, in Buffalo. Of course, he was big. In oh yeah, well, he would do. He would, he would uh, cross the border to make money. Yeah, oh. yeah, and uh, and then uh, Tommy's uh, writing collaborator Will Ivankovich, who plays guitar as well and, and sings in the band. Yeah. You know, and uh, people that are outside of this rock bubble and, you know, you've done way more than I have. But to to bring a guy like uh, Lawrence Gowan in, I mean, he's talented, all that stuff. But you have to get along with him the other 23 hours of the day, too. Well, um, since I got along with hockey players to start with. (laughs) uh, And he's Canadian. It makes it easy. Easy transition. It was an easy transition. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. But he just kind of came in and just fit right in. huh? Well, it. uh, Yeah, it. uh, He's a really talented man, a really intelligent man, uh, a very clever man, and uh, I don't know, my better half, <laughs> uh, dearly departed better half, was very fond of, of Lawrence, hmm. and so she sort of took him to lunch a whole bunch of times, you know, so he could get acquainted and stuff like that, so, hmm. yeah. So what do you consider uh, sticks after all these years? Are you guys a rock band, or do you fall in the prog rock arena? Well, I think I think it's it's hard to define us because a lot of the stuff is prog, right? Um, but you know, some of the ballads you have to say are just pretty pretty well straight ahead rock ballads, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, we never really got us quite as far as jazz fusion. Although I was a big fan of Mahavishnu Orchestra and did a solo record with Jan Hammer way back when. What was the rock record? Mm-hmm. And Jan had just before that had done with with, with Neil Schoen. Uh, that's kind of when uh, the the Mahavishnu's went <laughs> went mainstream, uh, but uh, yeah, I've I was brought up on all kind of music. Uh, as I played clarinet, inherited a clarinet from my uh, older sister, and we, well, we want you to play you know something in the school band. So okay, there's the clarinet. It's sitting here. I'll play it. Mm. And uh, that was your introduction. Well, to. to uh, we were all started on piano at age five in my house, so we all took piano lessons. You would sit, that's a piano. Hey, so. <laughs> nice. And so Jerry Lee Lewis was also something I was very interested in, you know, banging on the, the 
Those Ivories, 88. And you ever have a chance to meet him? You know, I think I was in the room with him at one point in time. Um, but I don't think we really didn't have. So I was I was there. I saw him. That he was, he was actually alive. Yeah, he yeah. Had a robot, <laughs> and uh, but it, you know, no no real chance to uh, to to go beyond that. Mm-hmm. that. Now you talked about like you know growing up playing piano and, and all that stuff, but uh, it's funny because uh, when I when I interview guys that have been in the business as long as you have, it's about the Beatles. Uh, a little bit younger, it's about Kiss, and then it becomes Metallica. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so was was did, where, do you remember where you were when uh, the Beatles were on the Ed Sullivan show? Uh, were you watching it? Oh sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. Was that a trigger point for you? Um, perhaps it was. Uh... You know, I was I was into rock and roll at the time. I had two older sisters who had a lot of rock and roll records, so mm. I was exposed to it through, you know, uh, older sister Patricia, ten years older, and then sister Barb was eight years old, and so it was okay to have rock records in the in the house, and uh, you know. But I really went. I saw Jimi Hendrix play live five times. Whoa! Wow. <laughs> And there's not a lot of people. I was going to say, I don't know if I've ever met someone. I did talk to someone recently that saw Hendrix play live, and I can't remember who that was, but not five times. That's impressive. That's the most profound influence on my playing. No kidding. And, you know, I have all his records. And uh, and then there was Cream. I saw Cream play a number of times. And, and really, I my lead guitar playing technique, what I did was I took Clapton solos. And in the old days, they, when they had talked – Spoken word records, they were at half the speed of 33 and a third. They were like at 16. Mm, wow. So I slowed I slowed Clapton's solos down to half speed. They're still the same notes an octave down. And and so I, because he's playing playing really fast, but at half speed, I, I, could, I could decipher what it was. And I'd sing the line, and then I'd sing it along with him until I was right with it. And then I'd say, how did, how did he finger that? And just mess with that. Mm-hmm. And so I <clears throat> thank you, Eric Clapton. <laughs> for teaching me how to play lead guitar. Backstagecountry.com, your online home for all things country music. It's going to be a busy year for country superstar Jason Aldean. He's extended his Highway Desperado tour and is teaming up with Kid Rock for Rock the Country tour dates. We've ranked our top five Jason Aldean music videos. Text Jason to 45911 to see if your favorite made the list on backstagecountry.com. Text Jason to 45911 and we'll send the link straight to your phone. It's funny how many how people talk about how they learn to play. My brother is seven years younger than me, and he grew up in the MTV era, and he would actually pause the TV and see where the players put their fingers. Uh-huh. And well, to this day, he still plays. Well, it, it's if you don't have technology to help you, a lot of times you're you're going to be lost. And uh, fortunately, I have. Well, my dad wanted us all to go get a college degree, so I have went to Illinois Institute of Technology and have a degree in mechanical and aerospace engineering. Mm. And that came in that came in uh, uh, that came in big time with your uh, last what well the record in two thousand was eighteen the mission right um, <laughs> not exactly I mean the one thing it did is it allows uh, allows me to actually talk to Tom Scholes okay because oh, I, right. I, I don't have quite quite as much technical <laughs> education as him but uh, I think yeah he went to MIT or something right MIT oh. and uh, graduate and and invents the Rockman and that kind of stuff so. But but his wife is a big Sticks fan. She was coming out to shows like with her, one of her girlfriends, and and, and we'd hang out with her. <laughs> Shoals, his wife and his girlfriend, uh, a few times. I mean, there were not a lot, but we became. Uh, that's how I became acquainted personally with Tom Scholes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I share a birthday with him. That's as much as I know, I know about Tom Scholes. <laughs> I've never met him or anything, but uh, those Boston records were fantastic. But getting back to Hendrix, so you see Hendrix for the first time. Are you just like blown away? Um, I have to say that, uh, yes, um, there was a, I went to Illinois Institute of Technology. There was also an Institute of Visual Design that was attached to it. And, and all the, all the engineers were nerds mm-hmm. of which I was one, uh, all, but I wanted to be with the cool guys. And so my best friend in the world, um, came from the, the design side and we'd hang out and talk about music. And then there was another friend there that I'd known in local bands who also was had a design degree and uh, who was a, very much a student of playing, you know, white guys playing on the blues. Mm-hmm. And so Paul Petratus and Steve Jones kind of helped lead me on on that path with the guitar. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's that's impressive. I'm trying to remember. It's killing me. I can't remember who I just talked to. I talked to a lot of uh, a lot of musicians, a lot of guys in bands. You know, I was thinking about this earlier today. So you guys are around the '70s, '80s. Did the grunge thing have any effect on you on you guys? I think zero. Zero. Okay. I mean, it, it allowed you to get a little grungier, maybe in some some of your passages, and maybe go a little further off center from what the average fan might want. To take a few more risks mm-hmm. since it was it had an audience out there. Uh, and, and I, I sort of relate to the mindset of grunge, uh, you know, it's just very antisocial, but, uh, uh, you know, you didn't see a dip in your audiences or anything like that. Like some of the bands suffered. Um, maybe we did. Okay. Is our tour manager <laughs> nodding his head. Yes, we did. <laughs> but ultimately all things must pass. Thank you, George Harrison, for that title. But that that ultimately went away, and 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 now we we are selling concert tickets like crazy. At this uh, fifty years into having a recording contract, yeah, wow. And uh, I'm the only one in this room that signed that contract, and uh, Dennis is not in the band anymore. John Panazzo passed away. John Serluski passed away. Uh, Chuck Panazzo comes out from time to time, but he's he's really not instrumental in making the records. Um, so we're uh, yeah, you're carrying on the legacy. We've evolved. Yeah, yeah. Fifty one years in. Uh, do you do you have like a lot of stuff like uh, uh, in the vault? You know what? Um, maybe I I don't know. I've I've, I've put stuff away. But I don't. I haven't, I haven't bothered to look at any of it for a long time. You're not you're gonna throw that out, aren't you? No. So, okay. so when, when you're when you're writing stuff, or you get a riff or something, do you do what some of these other guys do and, and play it into your phone? Um, that is one way of capturing it. Well, yeah, uh, it's a good idea. I think I'll do that. I know. Well, I know. <laughs> Yeah, Kirk Hammett has done that in the past, and apparently, supposedly lost his phone one time, and before they recorded one of their albums. Oh, I see. In air quotes. So, uh. so, anyways, <laughs> but yeah, you guys have been around a long time. What are your thoughts on the uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? Well, um, I don't know. It's 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 very um, East Coast centric in terms of the people that have a vote. Yeah, and uh, Sticks probably deserves to be in there. But I'm I'm not holding my breath. It's it's just our type of music and and uh, the audience that we basically that love our music and buy millions of our records don't have a vote. Hmm. It is amazing the bands from that era. As, as I sit here and talk to you, and I didn't really think about that, but there are a ton of them that are not in there. Yeah, it's unbelievable. Well, it's, I mean, you guys played uh, stadiums. There's there's thirty or forty people that decide who's going in. Right. Not. 30,000 and 40,000 voting. Right. And uh, I won't mention names. Uh, that might guarantee we never get in. Um, but it's, you know, I don't honestly, will I have a smile on my face when I go to my grave if I haven't made it in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? Sure. Right, right. <laughs> I mean, we, we've played in front of audiences and people have said so many wonderful things about J.Y., your, your music has changed my life. Your music saved my life, mm-hmm. got me through a most difficult time when my girlfriend or my mother passed away and I was listening to your music that helped get me through my most difficult time. And so what, what could be more significant than that than another human being say that you, you saved my life, you, you made my life better, you allowed me to see things in a, in a light that I could still survive and, and and go on so that, that's the kind of stuff that you don't hear about but it's it's out there and it's it's it's, ap- it's absolutely factual in terms of how people i mean music affects everybody differently and we've we've made some great records no doubt about it and uh i guess you, you what what you're talking about is it's it's better to have that from the fans and i mean you shouldn't say better but you got that. You don't really need uh, a plaque on the wall. I won't mention names, but who bleepity 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 from the East Coast, you know, elite voters 
Doesn't matter. Yeah, right. Uh, have they ever have they ever contacted you to get gear for a display or anything like that? I don't even know if, if you guys have been in there before. Well, we've uh, we, we may have an item or two that are in one of these museums, like a Mister Roboto mask or something. <laughs> I don't think that's in there. <laughs> like some guitars or some stage-worn gear or something along those lines. Let's see what I'm getting from the peanut gallery here. <laughs> <laughs> getting some notes over there as far as the uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. When was the last time you were in there? Have you been in there before? Nope. Oh, you've never been in there? Wow. Unbelievable. I thought being so close, you might have uh, taken a, a trek we over there. you have something there, George? One, one time they wanted to paradise theater. Here, go ahead. T- talk to that microphone right oh, there. Here. One time oh. they wanted to. I don't know if that mic's even working. Go ahead. Just yeah. At one time, they had inquired about the Paradise Theater sign from the 1981 Paradise Theater tour. Oh. Which we still have in storage somewhere. At one point, we were sending it off to them in Cleveland. Wow. So then it kind of went back and forth. So I don't don't know what. what So that was on the back of the stage. That was actually the front of the stage. It, It hung about six or eight foot in front of the stage. It was a metal sign, and back then there weren't LED. Light, yeah. Oh, there wow. Were, there weren't, or well, it was a lot less, but, oh. it was, but it hung in downstage in front of the stage. Hmm. <laughs> you you, you like the big uh, production up there? Well, uh, yeah. yeah. I'm a, an American male. <laughs> Bigger is better. <laughs> Speaking of that, did, uh, do, you, do you remember the first time, like, uh, just throw this out, do you remember the first time you saw Spinal Tap? Um, vaguely. <laughs> what do you say? <laughs> well, our, our manager at the time was Derek Sutton, right? And, uh, I think he was a technical consultant on the whole thing. Oh, yes. wow! Yeah. yeah. Oh, I was going to say, I was just thinking about that. So you got the Paradise Theater, a nice, see, a nice thing, and then near the end of the show, it's like all, it's all like falling apart and stuff, right? Yeah. Is that how it works? So yeah, I, I, there were some guys I was talking. To, I think David Coverdale. He was, he was horrified the first time he watched Spinal Tap. He said. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you guys got coming up? Just a big tour this summer? Anything else happening? We're going out with Foreigner, and uh, what's the name of the tour, George? It's the uh, Renegades and Jukebox Heroes yeah, That's tour. it. That's it. So uh, Renegade is our big song, and Jukebox Heroes for the Foreigner, obviously. Right, yeah. And so we're looking, we're taking that across North America, and uh, yeah, starting very soon. Well, it's funny. I had a band in here on Tuesday, and uh, they were here in a young band called uh, uh, Palier Royale. And um, so anyways, I'm talking to them, 20, 25-minute interview. And, you got anything else you guys got going on? Uh, nothing, nothing. Everything's fine. Talk to them. They were leaving the whole thing. The Joker trailer comes out the next day, and they do a cover of Happy Together, and it's their song, and they didn't even say a word about it. <laughs> and I'm like, wait a second. Did you did you not know about this? Were we not allowed to talk about it? So you're, I'm not going to you know say goodbye, and then you're going to, you know, Sticks is going to have some sort of grand something coming up, right? <laughs> um, well, I, I, I don't. I'm not necessarily in, you know, hearing everything first, um, but I mean, dumb luck can happen, you know, anytime, any place, and uh, if, you know, if you can't get it by hard work, I'll take dumb luck. Yeah, right, dumb luck for sure. <laughs> you working on anything new right now? Yeah, pine knob. Yeah, t- yeah. You working on anything new, or um, you kind of concert just on tour? We we haven't really. Uh, started in earnest i know tommy keeps writing mm-hmm. and uh lawrence i feel keeps writing uh me i've gotten lazy <laughs> do you ever does it ever cross your mind the last stick show the last stick show uh well i intend to live forever okay all right so and they, i'm uh they keep it going i take vitamin d3 <laughs> and k2 every day and if you want to avoid cancer and heart attacks D3, <laughs> K2, daily. But seek, seek professional help, too. Got to say that. <laughs> no, you, you, you can come to me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Dr. JY. Hey, man, really great to meet you. Pine Knob coming up on a June 15th, Renegades and Jukebox Hero Tour. Uh, of course, with uh, Sticks, Foreigner, and uh, John Waite. Thank you so much for coming in. Meltdown, you out of Maine. What a legend. I mean, and for the fact that that band is not in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame is insane. I think they had four records in a row back in the day, sell three million copies. 
And I mean, then, you know, a couple of them probably sold more. But that's just insane that that band is not in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Just another reason why that whole organization is just fraudulent as far as I'm concerned. Anyways, got to thank uh, JY and his manager for us uh, coming in. Just a pleasure. Um, After we did the interview, we hung out. I think we talked for another 10 or 15 minutes here in the studio. He didn't even want to leave. He signed some records for me, gave me some guitar picks, took some pictures. Uh, Just a super nice guy. Like I said, going out on tour, if you're anywhere in the Southeast Michigan area, that's happening at Pine Knob on June 15th, Renegades and Jukebox Hero Tour. Uh, That's with um, the guys from Foreigner and John Waite as well. Like I said, John Waite, just so talented, such a great guy. Hey, thank you so much for checking out Talk and Rock. We'll do it again real soon. I'm off next week as I record this, but we'll be back soon enough. Thank you for listening to Talk and Rock with Meltdown. You can help this podcast grow by giving it a five-star rating and writing a review on Apple and iTunes. Plus, feel free to subscribe and share it with your friends. Until next time, thanks for listening to Talk and Rock. Backstagecountry.com, your online home for all things country music. Like most fans of country music, we're excited to learn that Luke Combs was back in the studio working on his next album. We've come up with our list of iconic Luke Combs music videos. Yes, Lovin' On You made the cut. Text Luke to 45911 to see if your favorite made the list on BackstageCountry.com. Text Luke to 45911 and we'll send the link straight to your phone.